Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or good day, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to the next episode of No Dice, No Glory. Sponsored by our jobs that actually pay us money, we're coming to you not at all live from an abandoned arms factory deep under a mountain in West Virginia. We are proud to proffer to you the finest in wargaming coverage. Without any further ado, let's get this show on the road. Well, this is going to be an awkward one because I'm going to say thank you, Sean, for the lovely introduction. <laughs> but with You're us, welcome. but with us returning after being in um, isolation, I guess it is in Cleveland, Ohio. I wouldn't say I was isolated. I would say it was ostracized. <laughs> okay, ostracized. But uh, you never call. You never write. Uh, that's not true. But welcoming back to the show. Well, hi. Is one and only Sean Sarah. How you doing, Shawnee? Good, man. How are you, dude? It's good to be back <laughs> behind the microphone with my boy Mitch. I know. You know, it's funny. Since you stopped doing recordings... Your listenership has gone down like 90%. And we haven't gotten an E rating. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I think we need to change that in the first 10 minutes. No. I will... I'm going to see how far you could go. Without me cursing? Because a lot of guys are like, you know, I can let my children listen to the podcast now. Well, that's their fault for having children, not my <laughs> fault for having an expressive sort of turn of phrase. Well, let's see if we could use a different phrase. So, refrigerator. So, so anyway, so we're here, and, you know, we're not going to talk about a particular game. We're going to talk about... What Sean's been up to. What have I been up to? And uh, maybe we'll even talk about the movie First Man, which we, we just might, got finished watching. We might talk. We, 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 we have been talking a lot about the movie First Man. Yeah. So uh, yeah. so what have you been up to since you left here in March? Oh, my God. So many things. Uh, well, uh, I haven't got to do a lot of miniature stuff, which super bums me out. Um, but I have been working on my uh, role-playing community, which is Welcome to the Party. Uh, we stream 10 to 12 role-playing games a week on Twitch.tv, Welcome Party RPG. Um, I have been taking voiceover lessons. I just cut my first demo today, um, so I will. I am technically, once I get that demo back, a professional voiceover artist, which will be super awesome. Really? And as part of that, um, you can check me out at SeanSaraVO.com, where you can also see my nearly weekly podcast called The Waveform, where I talk all about my journey into voiceover. Uh, well, I didn't even know you were doing another podcast. I, I do a, a one-man podcast where I, because it's literally just about me doing voiceover stuff. Um, and, and, I might, and what's the listenership like? Is it is it up there? Literally nothing. It's literally me talking to a microphone <laughs> and then putting it on my website. Well, maybe we should like uh, link to No Dice No Glory. You should do that. You're one of the you know the first guys in No Dice No Glory. So you say you haven't been playing miniatures. Well, there's no. So there are <laughs> some apparently some places to play in Cleveland. There just aren't many. And most of them are not anywhere near where I live. Um, and there's this one place called the War Zone that is like this super old school sort of place, but it's on the other side of town. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just I have made it over there because you're not there, Mitch. Well, I and that's without I, you there. And it's Cleveland. I'm still scared because you know they had a river on fire fifty years ago. <coughs> Yeah, well, the memory. 50 years ago. It's the memory of it. So what game do you miss the most? What do I miss the most? Yeah. Uh, and I'm just talking game, not people that play the game. Third edition, Flames of War. <clears throat> well, I don't think you'd be alone there. I think a yeah. lot of people. I think that's what I miss. That is the game I miss the most. Um, I, I, do miss, uh, I do miss playing bolt action a little bit. Uh, I'd like to find a way to play that again, Be and you've been raving about it recently. I have. I think it's an amazing game. I do miss Blood and Blunder, because we were just getting into that in the year before I left. And, and it's blown up. Yeah, and it's blowed up. And I would and I would really... We had also started doing a lot of uh, Napoleonic miniature stuff. Yeah, you know, I, I actually went with... Uh, I went down and I met uh, Ken Jacobson, and we mm -hmm. played some naps. How was that? <clears throat> it's great. Uh, I, you know, Napoleon at Wars on version 2. Oh, did it? Did the second version come out? It did. There's did not a lot of changes, and actually, it? you could go to the Facebook group yeah. and like download all the changes. Did some? Did somebody else take over the product? Like, are they? Yeah, Sibo, Sibo's so, little dudes in um, Switzerland. Okay, so it's a new company. Do they have new support for it? No, they... I think it's just a guy that reprinted the book. Oh, okay. Same typos are still in it. Oh, well, that's a bummer. Light infantry is deadly. Yeah. You know, so you say you miss Flames of War version three. I do. And I got to tell you, and it's, I, you know, I went a while with, like, not playing. It's been a while. Yeah, and then I got back into playing. Hello, puppy. But it seems, it's, everything is mid-war. 
Yeah, I heard that. And everything in Midwar, like, <laughs> are, so I was talking to the one, the only Ben Goble. Oh, yeah. And I heard. Friend of the show. Friend of the show. Uh, all around bad person and friend of the show. <clears throat> I heard that Ferdinand's cost something like 10 points less than a tiger. Uh, um, I think it's 12 points less than a tiger. How does everyone just take Ferdinand's in mid-war and just everyone fights Ferdinand's against Ferdinand's now because there's really no reason to do anything So else. you could take a Brumbar Ferdinand company where one platoon is Brumbar's, the other one's Ferdinand's. In mid-war? Yeah. Is that what <coughs> most people do? Because why would you do anything else? You know, um... Well, I mean, literally, why would you do anything else? So the day the book with them, uh, Cross of Iron, came out, yeah. I played a list from it with Ferdies because I have Ferdies from my old yeah. um, uh, Road to Rome. Yeah, I, I have Ferdinand's and Brumbars. I never got to play my Brumbars <coughs> because apparently they were great in second edition and not so good in third. Yeah, but now you can run a company of them. But I would die to run a company of Brumbars. And, you know, I actually beat Ben Goble. <coughs> we had a mid-war tournament uh, to celebrate the launch of the books. Sure. But, like, everything's mid-war, and the last tournament I went to, and I'm not knocking these guys, but it was, like, four dudes. And it's four guys that I love. Well, you know, well, you three know. of them I love. And it was like, no, we got to get the tournament in. And, you know, it's I really want to start playing the game not in tournaments more, and it's it's just kind of weird. I don't know why. So the reason, actually, I should bring this up on here, the reason I haven't sold my Flames of War, although I'm open to offers and I have quite an extensive collection as I'm starting a small business. And well-painted. And, and an incredibly well-painted uh, assortment of British, German, and American, and Japanese stuff. Mm -hmm. so I, I will take your offers on it. Um, but the reason I haven't actively tried to sell it yet isn't just that there's not a huge market out there. It's because I also kind of miss it still, in which he, uh, <laughs> Mitch is continuously sneezing, which is what that death sound is you, you kind of hear every once in a while. I, th I think he might actually be dying. But no, I... No, I, actually, it's not coming through. I. Oh, I, well, fine. I'm watching Mitch die, <laughs> and none of you can hear it, and so you're just hearing me talk about his death. I have a bad cold. Yeah, and I'm getting his bad cold because I'm staying at his house here in sunny Springfield, Virginia. Anyways, the reason I... So for the fourth time, the reason I haven't sold my Flames of War stuff is because I want to play it again. I my I saw my tigers over at Ben's house, and I'm like, I miss playing my tigers. They're so much fun. I have a whole tiger company. I yeah, 29 points each. Maybe yeah. you could put three in the list. No, no, because does anybody play 100 points, to, honestly? I think it's 109 this year for Mid-War is what oh, they're setting it up, and okay. everybody likes doing whatever Dave sets yeah, yeah. for that. But, you know, <clears throat> here's my thing with it, and I still have a ton of, What's your of Flames of War. Yeah. Is that... There is no better 15 millimeter World War II game out there. Absolutely not. 100. percent It is the best 15 millimeter World War it's, II game. It just is not as good as its previous edition. Well, and you know, a lot of folks are going to agree with you. <clears throat> My thing is that, you know, just before Fourth came out, yeah, and we've talked about this so many times. Yeah, we went over Fourth a lot, and a we lot of guys were there. looking for a jump out point. And, yeah. and here in this area, you had the I-95 guys that yeah. were really good. And they stopped playing. Yeah. And, and, you know, when Steve and John and Luke, you know, like Luke yeah. decided to sell all this stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> that, y you know, it's it's different now. And, you know, I enjoy playing it the the few times I play it. But it's, yeah. you know, when you're going to post the scores and I'm like, dude, I had enough of that. Wait, so the the people who are left around just care about their tournament scores because they just want to go to Masters? Yeah, I mean, a lot of folks like that. But then again, it's this area because you yeah. have a lot of the good players have always come from this area. Yeah. But, you know, like if a bomb hit <clears throat> one of our events and like a Able Company event, yeah. then you'd have like two guys in Canada. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind well, of one of those things. still have the West Coast guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, one or two of those guys. Yeah. But really, and that's what bums me out, like, and the thing that, in general, and why I've gone to role-playing games, right, uh, as my kind of go-to gaming thing right now. One is it's non-competitive, which is nice. Right. We, we sit around and we, we bullshit for four hours, and we kill big monsters that one of us is running, but that person is still kind of rooting for the people and not for the monsters. If they're a good human being, they're rooting for the people and not the monsters. Um, but it, it seems like everything else, like with miniature war games... 
it's so sectionalized, right? Like, you've got your hot spots for every game, unless you're Warhammer, right? Which you can go anywhere and find Warhammer games. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you're Warhammer, it's everything is pockets. It's if I, I, I am lucky enough to live in a place where people play this. Right. Right. Or if I have the energy, like with everything else going on in my life, to be the one who tries to build the community. Right. Right. Like taking my little like bit of blood and plunder. Like if I were to like dedicate myself, get it all painted and then like go to one of these miniature stores and be like, I'm going to run the demo of this every Saturday afternoon. But that's what you got to do. Yeah, but I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that guy. So you know, it's interesting I, you talk about that, yeah. and it's it, it, and you know, people are going to listen and they say, "Oh, he's like Troy now. He's bad mouth and flames of war." No, it's I'm the not best. Bad no, no, I'm talking about me. Oh, okay, it's the best 15 millimeter World War II game, it, it is, and I want to play it more. I want to play more pick pick up games. But yeah, somebody reached out to us from Iowa. Yeah, and they want to start a community. And sure. one of the new writers we got, uh, Tom Gall, who seems to play everything. Hi, Tom. Nice to meet you. Yeah, like Tom plays everything, and you got to follow that guy on Facebook because he played four games of Armada this past weekend. He's huge into Cruel Seas, which we'll talk about in a minute. I want to play that game. Yeah, it's it's a good game. And then, you know, he is working with this guy, and I'm sorry I forgot your name, man, but he's working to start a community. We're going to host an event there. But, I mean, a lot of that is like, look, you know, I realized a while ago that when you buy – an army in a game, you need to buy two. Yeah, you absolutely need to buy two. And and that is how you grassroots grow a game. Yep. And but that also means a couple of things. Like I am starting a small business. I do not technically have a job. I cannot be the guy who has to buy two armies and then spend the time But in Flames you have plenty of Germans and plenty of I have plenty of everything. Yeah. And it can be yours for the low, low price of just email me and we'll talk about it. So I mean <clears throat> And that's the thing. It's like, you know, I really miss Flames. You know, I just, um, I I just, at some of the events, I notice it's, you know, you see the same guys. And they're they're awesome dudes, but I notice I'm having less fun. But that's what community is, not the less fun part, right? Right. The, The seeing the same dudes and growing those relationships over time. Yes. But I think both of us had been in Flames of War long enough to see this impressive growth spurt, right? Where I remember my first nationals, uh, there were probably 90 people, and then there were like 120 at the next one, and yeah. then that was kind of the peak out, right? Right. Uh, and then it kind of was like 110 or something at the next one. Um, and then it, and then fourth edition came out, and you know, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say that because <clears throat> I like fourth edition. I see. I like the, the rules for fourth edition. I miss. I want the rules from 4th edition with the army list of 3rd edition. Yeah, you know, one thing I do miss is, like, all the named armies. Like, if I want to run the 116th Panzer, granted, I could run that. Yes. And then now it's a little bit more generic, so the historian in me yes. is gone. But, I, you know, here's my thing. It's you the, can... the game peaked for so long, Yeah, <clears throat> and it's still a great game, is that 4th edition came out, and, and that's usually... Like, you know, a uh, watershed era where people say, I'm going to play something else. But the other thing that happened, and we really have to s- talk about this because yeah. it's kind of why we're here. Yeah. Is that so many great games hit the market in the last six years. But did they, here's the thing. And I'm, I don't mean to be, n- as much as I love bolt action. Yes. Blood and plunder. Yes. Any form of Napoleonic I can get my hands on. Right. It doesn't matter if a game hits the market if it doesn't legitimately take off. Right. Right. Like, you're not... I don't see any of the... The thing that cut market share away from Flames of War was Team Yankee. It wasn't any of those other games. It was Team Yankee. Right? Like, that's that's what cut the market share away from Flames of War. And, you know, I don't know if I can 100% agree with that. And, you know, I know from talking to Tom Burgess (coughs) that, you know, that is hard to qualify... I do notice that there's... The Mark I eyeball tells me. Well, I notice that there's guys that I see at Team Yankee events that don't... You know, we just did the Iron Man. Yeah. And we had 18 people play both games. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. But the thing is, I so I'm, I'm looking at it from a year out of the hobby. I don't know what's happened in the last year of the hobby. I can only tell you what happened in the first two years of Team Yankee, uh, which 
crossed over essentially with the first year of fourth edition, right? Mm-hmm. And then prior to that. Um, and to me, it seemed like the people's exit was to Team Yankee, and there was a significant drop in overall player within Flames of War in my last year that I got to legitimately play the game. Well, I mean, some people were dying for a good modern rule set in 15 millimeter, and the game came out, and people started to play it. Yes. And, you know, I hate to say it, like, you know, at a, at a, at a, at a convention, right? Yes. You maybe have three days of gaming. Yes. You, you can't play two tournaments that are at the same time. You cannot. Right, unless you're the Flash. Unless you're the, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think that's really what it is. It, it's within the market. It's, I want to go play other games, and and I find some of the other games really are really good. Yeah, but here's the thing, and uh, I keep coming back to this: none of them have the same number of players as a Flames of War tournament. You mean like 120 people? And will not. Like I will say this authoritatively: as much as I want them to succeed. And you're only talking historical games. I'm miniatures. talking historical games because yeah. historical games inherently fulfill a niche. There are X number of people who will be interested enough to A, spend the money, B, spend the time or the additional mon- money getting those armies painted, mm-hmm. and C, traveling for a historical war game. And that, that, that universe of people is smaller than it is for non-historical war games. Well, I mean... 120 people is amazing. Amazing, but it takes it takes other games time to grow. Ago. It was it was more than that. It was maybe more than that because yeah. we're fucking old. Right. So, <coughs> you know, like uh, just talking. Uh, mark the time. Yeah. I, I just cussed for the first time. Yeah. And, and it's 9:45 p.m. Eastern. And we're 60 minutes and 30 seconds in. It only it took me more than 10 minutes to <laughs> drop my first bomb, and it was a self-censored f bomb. Well, thank you for self-censoring, but yes. like, you know, like talking to Mike Tunez last week, yeah. they're having 40 people at an event at Adepticon. For which? Uh, Blood and Plunder. That's awesome! Right. That so is one event. It takes, it takes time for games to grow, and then the other one, too, is it's like, you know, this is the only hobby where folks have OCD and ADHD. No, it's not. Yeah, can, it is. I can tell you factually that is not great. This is not the only hobby where people have OCD. Well, and ADHD. okay, this hobby has OCD and yeah. ADHD. Yeah. Where you know they're very meticulous about certain things. Yes. But their attention span moves to whatever they feel the next hotness is going to be. Factual. <clears throat> I'm sure there's other things like yeah. that, but this is I'm talking about miniatures, and I I think it is there. I really think it's the flood of new games, and I think that's great because I think that. That makes existing games and game companies write better games. I think that is correct. I don't think you're wrong about that at all. That that they approve the game. I mean, look, Bolt Action is on its number two yes. edition. You know, other games are like upping the game because you have to. It's a competitive market out there. Yes. And, you know, World War Two. it's if people said, I want to do World War Two, recommend a game. <clears throat> I'd have to say what scale because no, you know what? If somebody I would not <clears throat> start there. I would not say what scale, because if somebody's asking me what World War II miniature game I should play, yeah. they probably don't know what scale is yet. Because World War II, I feel like, is probably the entry drug to historical miniatures. You really think that? I These days. Because if I walk into a miniature gaming store, I'm not going to see Napoleonics. I'm going to see Flames of War. Or you're going to see Warhammer or stuff Or Warhammer, like that. Right? right? Like, But those are what I'm going to see. Right. So I'm, I, I, I would not start with scale. I would <laughs> ask them, do you want big models or small models? Do you want a lot of models on the table or a few models on the well, table? Well, then saying to them, you know, do you want a skirmish game or something else would, would equally wouldn't understand that either. Well, they, I think you would understand skirmish, right? I'm just talking like how you communicate. Although this is all purely semantics. Yeah. But uh, essentially... You know, we haven't gotten hate mail in a long time, oh, and man. I think we're going to get it back with this podcast. I hope so. Please send me your hate mail. I feed off of it. You disliking my opinions makes me stronger. Okay. All right. Well, you all right there, there Chief? It felt good. I yeah. just needed to lean into that evil guy It's been for a, a long second. time. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, look at now they're going to, with Flames, Yes. It's they're going to pull the, they're going to upgrade Late War to the to the new version four standards Finally. as far as less 
you know, the big thing that came out that people were confused by was the, you know, taking support options with the mid-war stuff, which... How, how so? Well, you know, it, when you first read it, it's almost like you could take whatever you want on the list, and then, you know, on Facebook, between Alex and then Phil chiming in, they yeah. seem to have calmed people down, but it's it's almost like a lot of miniature gamers look for a reason to get all up in arms Everybody and wants to be mad about something. <coughs> yes. Yeah. And I I am not mad at version 4. I have nothing to be mad about with version 4. No, it's a great game. It's a good game. I am the the only thing I'm disappointed about with version 4. Okay, there's two things. One is air. I wish air was better. And two uh is uh the force lists. I am disappointed about those choices, but think the game itself at its core is fundamentally solid. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, you're not going to get an argument from me yeah. here on yeah. this one. And, and I, what I, what I'm trying to say is, I think in the in the in my own long-winded way is, I agree with you. People like to be pissed off because it feels good to be mad <laughs> at the man and the person who is making the thing that you think you can do better, but you can't actually do better because you haven't spent the hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars testing it. Yeah, well, and then here's the thing that is going to get me once again excommunicated from the uh, cruel seas. That, you know, the book came out. I interviewed John, and John told us yeah. about Cruel Seas a year ago. Yeah, at Gen Con. <laughs> Wasn't it Gen Con? No, it was... Um, it was Historicon. It was Historicon. Yes, because I freaked out about P.T. Boats and wanted to... And, you know, he's always Ask been... actually what your P.T. Boat can do for you. It was actually a year ago. We Ask. interviewed in one of our first interviews last January for No Dice, No Glory. Ask what you can do <laughs> for your P.T. Boat. But, like, you know, was the was the book... Oh, yeah, I remember that now. Was the Did the book have a bunch of errors in it? It did. Apparently, yes. It did. And then they reached the errata, which, if you printed out the pages, it came to, like, 12 pages. But when I cut and pasted it onto one page, it, yeah. it fit on one page front and back. It wasn't that much. <coughs> and uh, that, that, that sentence didn't make any sense to me. When I cut the actual pieces that were key... To changing the book, oh. I was able to, to condense it to one page. Oh, and people were like, you know, I need to get a free book, and then you know, no, you don't. Then they attack John. They're like, he's just an event coordinator. No, I'm he's like, not. So I mean, it's just funny. Like, and then like people made the comment, like, I don't know why they created this game. It's not like anybody wanted it, but it sold out. Yeah. Just because it's not your fun doesn't mean it's not someone else's fun. Right. Don't pee on other people's fun just because it's not your fun. Right. And, you know, it's almost like I've seen guys that bash games continuously and they don't really play it. And I think oh, at, yeah. I think at that point, and especially on the Internet, on Facebook, these people sway a lot of people that are iffy about a game. Yes. And f for those that are looking to seek knowledge on the Internet, I would ask somebody that you know plays the game. Yeah. Like, if you don't see a picture in their stream of them playing the game... They don't play the game. They don't play the game. Yeah. Maybe they played the game someday long, long ago. Right. And have some bad experience about it because they talked to somebody online and got angry about a thing. Or they didn't understand a rule. Or maybe they understood other rules and it just wasn't for them. That's fine. You know what? Don't screw with other people's fun. Just go find your own fun. And the other thing, too, is like you and I have worked on games. Yes. And like right now I'm working on an amazing game, Hearts Leviathan. Yes. <coughs> and... We are really, I mean, playing the hell out of it, trying to make it a better game. And it, it takes such a long time to put a product out there. Yes. Just to people to find that one thing that may have been missed, and they're all up in arms about of it. Of course they are, <coughs> because they know better than you. <gasps> Duh. You know, sometimes I often wonder if it's just a good way of not spending money. It is. You know, man, like, it, whatever people need to do to justify to themselves. Yeah. Right? Like, fuck. Sorry, there was a full one. Yeah. It's just, this is how frustrated I am, though, is like, and one of the reasons I've stopped being on Facebook, uh, one of the reasons I'm glad I no longer work where I used to work is because I'm done with other people's negativity. I'm just, I, I, the only thing I am negative about is other people being negative because you're just ruining other people's fun. Because people go on the internet and look for opinions about games. People, it's okay to be passionate about something you love. But if you're passionate about something you don't play, you're just being mean. 
if you're being negatively passionate about something you don't play. And we're not we're not bashing gamers because we're gamers too. No, and if you I meet am. Us, I'm going to stop you right there. There's plenty of things that games and, that we don't like. No, I, I I don't I can't think of a game that I don't I legitimately don't like. I'm sure there is one. I just haven't played it because I love all things. You no, know, and even if I don't like it, you know what I'm not going to do? Tell you your fun is wrong. If someone is telling you your fun is wrong, they have a problem and need to deal with that. Themselves. Yeah, that I agree with. You know, and here's the thing: I've met a lot of Star Wars diehard fans, none mu- as much as you. And when talking to you about Armada, which I like, yes, and even X Wing, you're I wish like, I liked them. you. That's what you say. You say, "I really want to like this." game. I want to like those games, <coughs> but my fingers are too fat to like those games. I mean, do you think too? Some of it is that there is no perfect game out there. No, there's no such thing as a perfect game, and that's fine. I, I think I like Armada more than X Wing because Armada, but it still came down to, and this is this is my issue. And is a, a core issue with a lot of small model count games. Mm-hmm. You can find the edge cases to be like, I'm going to run 12 Corelli and Corvette of mine, and that's going to be what I run, and it's going to be super broken, right? I don't know if that's really a thing. I'm just using an example. Um, for those of you out there who are diehard modern players, I'm glad you love your game. I'm just saying that the fewer models you have in a system, the easier it is to create edge cases. Yeah, you know, I wish that was the case with some of these games because I, I feel I have too much with Armada. Right. And, and X-Wing, I just upgraded to 2.0. No, I'm sorry. I haven't played it yet. Why? A lot of it's time. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's the thing, man. Like, <sighs> we, as we get older as gamers, we have to find the place to maximize our fun. And I want, if you love Armada, go play the fudge out of Armada. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. We're trying to prevent an E rating. If you love X-Wing, go out there and shoot down Slave 1, baby. <laughs> get it done, and I hope you have a lot of fun doing it. It's just, they're... I want. I've wanted those two games to be my jam since X Wing first came out, and I went, "Oh my god, it's an X Wing!" And I get to play it. It's a little guy, and it's super cool, and uh, it never really is. But you know, but they're great games. They are well constructed games. I think they, at a casual level, mm-hmm. X Wing is a well constructed game. So let me ask you a question: If you were yes. king for a day, yes, which may be you're delusional and you actually think I that, am king of my own world every day. What would you change about? Either of those two games to make it more to your liking. I am currently not versed enough in them to be able to tell you what would it. I think, I think I the thing I would change about them first of all is giving me skinnier fingers. I'll see if they can do that. Maybe yeah, you I think need that to would go. Be the first thing. Maybe you need to get captured by like one of those, you know, the the head drinkers. Yeah. Well, part of my problem is, and I think what that comes to is the <laughs> movement system, right? Is like I am not precise enough. To go play that game with people who care about precision. I will ruin their fun. Well, see, this gets into a question I think we touched on before. Yes. Do you play the games because it's fun, because you care about the story behind it, or do you just want to be known as the number one guy of that game in, you know, your local store or the world? But whenever I went and played with Not You, it was always people who really cared about being the number one person. Well, you see, but you say that, but we played almost all the time with Ben Goebel. Well, yes, but Ben Goebel pretends that he wants to be the number one person. He just well, he just likes to win and likes to compete, and I respect the crap out of him for that. But he didn't. He doesn't really care about that. Not in the way that, say, when we would go to a, a store local to us here to try and play X-Wing, and I would just walk away going, nope, 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 nope. nope and nope, that's the problem nope, of living nope, in a place nope, where nope. the game's popular. It yeah. also has some of the best players in the country. Yes, and I don't want to play with the best players for X-Wing. <clears throat> because they care about precision far more than my fat fingers allow me to care about precision. And, you know, you say that, and, you know, we're talking, and we we covered that store before and talked about I love about that it. store. In fact, I was there <laughs> earlier today, but they weren't open. But I learned a lot from those guys. Sure. I didn't win a lot. The game I lose a lot and enjoy is Magic the Gathering. And yeah, I, I don't I do not do card games. I love that game. You play it online. Play it online. And that way you don't have to have card stack. You just play it online. Yeah. I will show you how to play Magic Gathering <clears throat> Arena. Yeah, it I heard amazing. it's addictive. I'd rather not. It's good. Well, let's talk about other games. Sure. That, you know, that uh, I think we 
You know we're gonna get we're told, we're gonna get a ton of hate mail. This will not be a well listened to episode. People are like no, these gonna, guys are haters, and, and I'm not, we're I not. Think we've we're literally not. just I literally just gave a screed about not hating things, and that the only thing I hate is people who hate things. But people can hate you for that. I hate me for that. Bring Pe- it. People could totally hate you for I that. I hope you hate. I, if you hate me for that, then we're not gonna be friends anyways, and that's fine. So let's look at like. Um, so what I've been getting into lately too, and and is is board war games. Yeah, have you gotten tested for that? No, I have not. You it, should. Yeah, you see, and you know, I cover this, and every once in a while, in an article, and I have the an article chlamydia? coming up about Gettysburg, about two games I played, and it's two armies at Gettysburg. Well, it's it's the tale of two Gettysburgs. A tale of two Gettysburgs. <laughs> it's miniature gamers are a different breed than board war gamers. I really yes, it's like ASL man. <laughs> It's like Advanced Squad Leader. <laughs> There's a game I can never play. I've tried. I've tried it with you. It's an amazing game. Though. And I am sure that there are people out there who love that game. In fact, we, we have went. covered events where it was chock full of people who love that game. Thank you, Perry Cox, for the interview. Absolutely. Perry Cox. Is it, Wait. Is it Coke Cox? R- yes. He's a great guy from Multi Man Publishing. He's a great guy who was never on Scrubs. Yes, from Multi Man Publishing. That's very good. That's yeah. a really. I know. People have to really dig into that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I like hope that. so. I hope so. Um, but like you know, I've been picking up some, um, and I noticed these tween games are getting. Um, you know that's illegal, right? You have to wait till they're at least eighteen. I do understand that, but okay. like games like um, uh, the Plastic Soldier Company line of games. How I have not played any of those games. So I got Cold War over there from the Kickstarter and World War One. Is Cold War a war game? Yeah. How is it a war game? It's. I mean, it's a war game. I'll show it to you when we get finished. Okay, no, I'm just wondering if it's about a Cold War. <coughs> or is it about, like, Finland? Or is it about the Cold War? It's about the 80s. Except gone hot? Mm, it could go hot. Oh, okay, so it's a, it's possibly a war game. Yeah, and they have I have Quartermaster 1914, okay. and I have the Great War Plastic Soldier Company. Uh, that's the one I was really interested in. <coughs> Which, you know, and it's funny because you played a game like it and you didn't like it. What was that? Because it's by Richard Berg, and we played that Napoleonic game with the blocks. Oh, God, yeah. I just, I something about the block games. They're very popular. They're very popular, but not like, the my issue being that you, and this is my the one time I played it and the way it was explained to me, and I am always willing to try things twice in case I did it wrong okay. the first time. The way that we learned the game when we played it was that I didn't know what any of your crap was. And it was like random activation, and those two things together made there too made there be too much variance in my decision making structure for me to find the game enjoyable. So, and I do want to talk about that because I brought it up in an interview we did with Mark Walker. Yes, and you didn't like the fact that you had to play action cards to determine what yes you were going to move. Because you wanted to... That's what it was. That's right. That's you wanted correct. to, as a gamer, to move what you want when you wanted it. No, I didn't even want that. I, I didn't want to just be able to move... Like, if you had given me a limited number of action points to spend... Yes. Where I still had a limited resource, mm-hmm. right, that wasn't pinned to a certain section of the map, right? Right. Which is what happened. Yes. I would be okay with that. Okay. It is limiting both geographically... Mm-hmm. And in terms of overall initiative, that I have a problem. Which is, to me, yes, how they introduce fog of war. Yeah, but into these games, that's a bad way to introduce fog of war. I I think it does it. It is for ge- me. It's a genius. I, I will say it is for me a bad way to introduce it. a game that you will not like, which I love. Yes, and Glenn and I played it, and we interviewed Mark Walker. Is uh, Nom sixty five, which doesn't even use dice. Not the, is that the one that there's a video game for? No. Okay. It doesn't even use dice. You you draw cards. I don't mind not rolling <coughs> dice. Yeah, and it is such I've an ingenious Malibu. game. Okay. And it's fun, and he's doing Afghanistan 85. Oh, neat. With that, too. And Glenn and I love playing it. Yeah. It's a fun game, but okay. it's, it's not traditional. But the thing is the cards... Because with the cards, you won't get to activate certain units in a turn. Yeah. And he goes, that's the fog of war. I don't mind not being able... Like, this is what I said, right? Like, not being able to get to activate certain units in a turn, fine. Only being able to activate 
a certain geographical area at a time, fine. Right. Linking those two things together is what irked me. Yeah. Well, and, you know, Glenn and I have tried the Revolutionary War series. Okay. And I got to say, if you want to learn anything about linear warfare, yeah. play that game. Why don't I just play like a Napoleonic miniatures game? Well, what, what I what, what am I what am saying. I not learning in a in a in a pike and shot or like a uh, a black powder game <laughs> that I would be learning in one of those? games? Well, you see, and there's the difference between miniatures and board games. If I buy the board game, I don't need to paint two armies. Like we were no, and about I'm before. totally down. Well, I, I get there's a the, the cost benefit analysis is I've paid a hundred dollars. Yes, I put some stickers on some blocks and I'm good to go. Yeah, it's a fun game. Right. I like it. I get that. And it's, it, I would be willing to revisit it, and I'm going to go to Cold War, so why don't you bring one of them with you? If I we have time. We have so much to play at Cold War. I know, but let's revisit it, because it seems like a conversation <coughs> worth revisiting at well, Cold Wars. Well, I'm, I'm, and you know the thing is, it's like I wish some of those games were more popular. <coughs> as I choke to death here. I would like to play that in its video game version. I would like to see a video game version of that. Well... But a game automated. in the series yeah. is has been ported to both video game what that? and on um, tablet, what and that's that? the Great War game. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, you could download it, and um, the problem is it's like after you play both sides, all the scenarios. You're that, done. That's kind, of, that's kind of it. Yeah. And then they just released the Ancients game on Steam oh, okay. a while ago. But it's the same thing too, you know. You play those with the cards, and yeah, <clears throat> which is the problem. And if I'm going to say anything bad about board war games, that you know, it's just as easy to to computerize most of them. Yes, do it. And In fact, why isn't do. that being done more? Well, the Operation Lord of War Four is a game I've played the crap out of since it came out. But there's no board game version that has the same mechanics and all the other stuff. No. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. It's yes. like, you know, I, I mean, when they port board war games, yes, it's hit or miss always. And you know, it's you don't see very many ports of miniatures games. In fact, I can't really think of too many. Uh, there are so many different Warhammer games. Okay, well, I'm, I don't do the sci-fi fantasy. Yeah, it's because you're made of wrong. <coughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm you do do the sci-fi sa- fantasy. You do Star Trek. I mean, Star, Star Wars. Wars. Yeah, but it's because I like the rule system. It's fun. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So I mean, maybe you know, whatever. I'm just saying. I I could deal with the, uh, the, you know, Star Wars is cool. Shut up. Yeah, I know Star Wars is cool. I'm well aware of how cool Star Wars is. So, I'm the one who introduced it to you. And um, yeah, I mean, especially on Kickstarter, which I'm seeing a lot of board war games coming out on, I which to me start. is not a, a good sign. No, it is not a good sign. Because it's it's the new version of P five hundred with less assurance. You mean really? Because I've been waiting for stuff to hit P five hundred for years. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Like, you here's the thing though: you know when something hit P five hundred, they're going to print five hundred of it, even if it takes years. You don't know with a Kickstarter game that you have successfully backed that you will ever see the product in your life. You know, okay. With that being said, almost every game I've seen backed. Or seen on Kickstarter yes. has been has 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 come to life. Do you years remember at later. Gen Con a couple of years ago? Yeah, we talked to the guys at Columbia, yeah, uh, the Danglishes. Yes, and they put a Kickstarter on with their uh, War in the Pacific game, strategic level. Yeah, <coughs> and you know that was funded, I think, in a day or two. Um, sure, uh, these things are getting funded, but it's you know with the amount of um, goals, stretch goals that you have. You know, you wonder, like, is that the best means to do these games or P500? I understand it's expensive, and trust me, I know how long it takes to develop games. Yes. But a lot of these games are repops. Yes. And that, to me, is, you know, I, I worry about that. There's, it, when it comes to board war games, there's a few things I worry about. One is that in 20 years, um, most of the guys that play them, Maybe even myself will not be around anymore. And you're so, going to be around in 20 years. Shut up. Not the way I'm feeling today, brother. No, no, I'm with you. So I um, picked this up from you. So uh, I learned it from you, Dad. Yeah. Um, that you know, I think a revolution has to happen in that, as it almost did with miniatures. 
Okay. Where people are putting out games with sex appeal that is kind of what the market wants. Miniature games with sex appeal have been around since the 80s. Yeah, be- just because what you put on the table is sexy. Yes. <clears throat> but with with board war games, I, I don't think you have. Yeah, no, I, I think <laughs> one of my fundamental say, excuse me, I'm yelling now. Because we don't speak Yonis here. We, I speak Yonis. Yeah. Um, one of the well, fundamental turnoffs for me of a game like ASL is that it looks bad. And I know that makes me an awful millennial, right? I know it does. But I had the same conversation with Dave Carvin. Right. And it's because the bulk of their fans have bought the games in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And they're stuck with it. Yeah. And you know what? There's also a comfort in it. I get Mm -hmm. that, right? There is nostalgia in it. And it feels good to go back to the thing you love. And I want you to love the thing you love and enjoy it. But for me, as someone who is relatively new to hex-based wargaming, mm-hmm. I look at that and go, but there's that really pretty one over there. Yeah. Why can't I go play the really pretty one with the big hexes that aren't hard to move? And, you know, you want to talk about uh, games that fix and tweak things. Do you remember that Guadalcanal game Love we that played? that game. That's what I was literally just thinking of. By Academy Games? Yes. There was one thing you and I did not like about it. What was it? Remind me. It was the activation system. Oh, yeah. I don't... Because yeah. once you activated one unit, yep. you had to either expend all the activation with that one unit yeah. before you moved on to another. Yep. Well, Uwe Eckert yes. came out with the third edition of Storms of Steel. Okay. Doesn't have that in it anymore. And oh, he's nice. re-releasing Kursk, and I'm going to get a copy. I've That's actually spoke to the guy on the phone. Okay. And I'm excited for that game because visually, it's beautiful. Yes. The counters are great. It's amazing. But- I am so excited for the new activation system to come out. Me too. That I can't even play the computer version of the game anymore. <laughs> because it's like, but I, I want to move multiple units. And you can't yeah. go back and move a unit you moved. It is, what he has done with those rules to me is, I thought the game had a, is a great game, but yeah. it had a flaw. And they've, and that was to me. Yeah. Other gamers may say. No, uh, I agree with you because. But they fixed it. Yeah, you can. I feel like, realistically, right, within an impulse, this unit provides cover fire, this unit moves up, right. then the covering fire unit moves up, right? Mm-hmm. Which was not a thing you could do in their system. Right. But is, I think, totally rational within a, a 10 minute span of a, like a war game's impulse, right. right? I think that is a thing that could happen. Yeah, I think if you played the second edition. Yeah. You could go on uh, line to academygames.com. Yeah. And, you know, we met some of those guys at Gen Yeah, Con. no, they're lovely human beings. And download third third edition. Mm-hmm. And, like, I am like everybody else. I keep going to Board Game Geek. Yeah. And, you know, for the Guadalcanal game. Hey, when are you going to update the rules for this like that? Yeah, right. Because you need a, there's a special die that the new game's going to have. And it will determine whether your unit is spent. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I really. And it, it's, uh, I think it's an eight-sided die, but it's, um. It's skewered, so I, you know, units become spent when they should. Like the numbers are higher. Right. I think there's like two sixes, two sevens, two eights, and uh, I'm kind of I'm looking forward to that game. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's other stuff I'm I'm looking forward to, but you know, for board games, I know not your jam. And then you know, we just picked up at No Dice No Glory, Philip Bulger, who's a diehard board war gamer. Oh, good. <laughs> West Point guy, another army tanker. Nice. And um, so we're going to be covering more of that. Okay. Because I I think that that's an interesting crowd. I think it is an interesting crowd. And I have, like, here's the thing. I had the old Avalon Hill Gettysburg board game. I had an old ship's board game from Iron Avalon Hill. Like, like when I was in my single digits and young double digits and have wanted to love Hex Wargaming ever since I was a wee baby. I played the original Operational Art of War, I played Operational Art of War 2 and 3, and now the new ones come out, and it's amazing! And that, I think, is how I like my board war games, is relatively automated, right? Yeah. But I can understand where especially older school gamers come from, and, you know, I. but then I see, like, that gold Juno sword thing we saw at a... a at the the uh, it was at David Garvin's house. No, no, no. It was at the tournament. Uh, it was at the. Uh, it was over in that one corner at the tournament two years ago. Yeah. 
and it was just like all of D-Day. And I'm like, I want that. I want that in my life. I want that to be a part of me. It was like 12 maps and like thousands of counters. And I'm like, every part of me wants to be a part of that. Right. But I don't understand. I don't. My brain won't let me. And it's just, you know, the key about miniatures is you, you play it in a couple hours. Yeah, and th- I think that's part of it, too, is because that game is going to take them all weekend, and they probably still aren't going to come to a conclusion. They right? probably haven't finished it. Yeah, and that is, it's a different pace. Well, let, let's go to video games. Let's go to video games. So, I'll tell you what games, um, I you know, I'm not playing first-person shooters anymore, and I don't want to talk about it. I uh, just, for well, some reason, they I just... I enjoy Battlefield Five. They Yeah, you know, it's the, that's the first Battlefield I never, I didn't buy. Interesting. I, I didn't buy it. It's fun. I never expect them to in any way be historically accurate. Yeah, it's. I don't know what it is. Uh, like I like the Great War one because I love everything Great War. Oh yeah, me too. And but you know, it's. I just got bored of them. That's fair. And even the one that you and I were playing, the Vietnam one. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're great games. I just for some yeah. reason doesn't hold my attention. Not as much. No. Nope. Um, but John Tiller, who mm. I love the, his games. Yeah. He's been making gold versions of some of his older games. That is not surprising. And the artwork in it is amazing. Oh, really? <coughs> and so I picked up some of the um, titles. I love the old John Tiller Civil Ooh. War games. Yeah. So, like, with his new version, and it's like the either 2.0 or 3.0, depending what the game is. Yeah. The artwork is, is amazing. Okay. The rules are slick. Oh, good. <coughs> I mean, it's a huge file. It's like yeah. a 3D map. But it's 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 jumped to that sex appeal thing, hey. and he's also doing gold versions of his World War Two games. Really? And if you own an old copy, yeah. either they'll look it up, or you just show them a picture of, "Hey, I have the disc." And I was oh. surprised. Like I bought almost every single one of those games. Oh yeah, back in the day, but, I don't, mostly the Civil War ones. Yeah, you know, I I liked Napo- his Napoleonics. I just never played them. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're fun. Okay. Um, John Tiller Software. Yes. Dot com. Yep. Go there. And then we have to mention Matrix because, you know, Paolo, one of our writers, yeah. works for them. And um, um, there's a game I'm excited about. And you remember the, the old Talonsoft War in the Middle East? Yes. Which had that crazy music playing as you went in and picked a scenario. Yes. And then they had the World War II version with Pacific, yes. East Front. Well, they updated the... Um, the Arab Israeli one to a version 2.0. Okay. And you can make it look like a hex encounter game. Fascinating. And the units do, the maps are made. You could play it the old style with the burning tanks. Yeah, yeah. But the the game is so good. Right on. And it, it you know, here's the thing. It comes with like over over 100 scenarios. Oh, cool. And you could play anything from 1948 to like the 80s. Okay. It even has like the British fighting in Aden. Really? <laughs> Yeah, you yawning you, again. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's we're getting old. We're getting old. And um, I just turned forty. So get this. Mm. So they're coming out with the Vietnam version of that game. Huh. Okay, I would totally give it a try. Why don't you set it my way? Yeah, I, I would totally. Uh, I you know, and I asked Paolo about it, and you know, he was like getting ready for his tournament in Milan this past weekend, which was a big success. Let's take a quick break. All right. So I, you know, we're gonna take a quick break and. Um, We'll be right back. Be right back. Bye. Hey, and we're back. Hello. So, uh, you know, I'd say it's like a day later and uh, we it's have more energy, but no, we'll, you know, don't worry, guys. It won't go on too much longer here because people are like, the, these guys really aren't talking about anything. We're talking about plenty of stuff and you are enjoying our banter. As as people said, they missed. Yeah. I know that's why I'm here. They really missed. I'm yeah. here to provide you with banter. So, so we covered the um, video games. We covered we board really, war I didn't games. Get to talk about any video games. You covered what you wanted. to Oh talk about well, games. well, you know. Go ahead. Well, what are you playing? What do I play? I'm playing Magic Arena. Yeah, a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm playing a lot of Operational Art War. Um, are you really? Yeah, dude. I've loved those games forever. Well, we may have to play online sometime. We should, because I, there's just, I don't know. To me, that is the right size and scale. What is your favorite scenarios on that? And you know you could download a ton of scenarios. There are a ton more yeah. scenarios. Uh, I mean, my favorite scenario is, uh, I think, the there's two D-Days on there. I like the D-Day one that starts with the invasion forces already on the beach, so that I don't have to worry about. Is that two weeks in Normandy? I think that's two weeks in Normandy. 
Um, and uh, did I do the World War? I like the World War One scenarios in that as well. Um, they have some good. They have some really good ones. Yeah. Uh, so I like the. I have played the crap. I've probably played it five or ten times. The uh, the August. 1914 scenario. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. And, and I, I think just, it's based on the game Guns of August. That wouldn't surprise me because it's just... And I always play it as the, the French and the Beth because it's no fun to play that as the Germans. Do you know what I find very interesting What's in those games is the um, the modern ones. I haven't got to... I haven't played many of the modern ones. I've like the Arab-Israeli like, ones and the Vietnam ones are amazing. Really? There's one where you can invade the North. Interesting. Yeah. It's, okay. It's pretty neat. I have to check that out. Yeah. But, you know, I like the older version. Yeah. Because every oh, really? time you click, like, am I clicking on all the units to attack or... But that is by Matrix Games. Operational yeah. War was at version 4. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's Operational Art of War 4. Which, the game's been around for, like, 16 years. It's been around longer. It feels like it's been around since at least the mm. 90s. Right. And I think that was the first decent... Yeah, it was the 90s. Yeah. I think that was the first decent attempt to take board war games and make no. them... Uh, no, because when I was in debate camp in 1995, I didn't know this. I wish I knew that. A long I time picked ago. up. It was a. I think it was an Avalon Hill Stalingrad game. Run. I think it may have been Talon Soft. Valaki Luki. I own Val. It is in that line of games because I picked up Valaki Luki later. I just like saying Valaki Luki. Yes. But those are all part of the same line, and yeah. I think those came out first. And you know what's weird? There's still a group of guys that play those games. But it's because they're lovely games. Yeah, they're really good. And I would I would kill for a more modern version of uh, cl the close combat series. Well, uh, those are so good. You're kind of in luck. Why? Because the next version of that game, it's going to feature the battles of the Big Red One. Oh, it, so like from Africa through... Yeah, I believe so, and it's a 3D version. And you could go on and see some of the screen grabs at uh, Slithering Matrix games. Oh, cool, okay. And they're redoing the game. <laughs> the re because everything that's come out, like Panthers in the Fog and Arnhem and all that stuff, yeah. are just using the old engine and updating it with scenarios. Not right? only did the engine work, but the U.S. Marine Corps used it to train... I'm I'm not surprised because yeah. those games were the close combat series of games were great and I played the crap out of all of them, but I would like to see a more modern updated version of that. At least in, like just I don't even think the mechanics need updated all that much, but the interface needs updated and the graphics need updated. Yeah, right. And if that's what they're doing, then you can call me a, a buyer. I will buy the crap out of that game. Well, then you know if you want to look at a game that's like that. Is and it's actually paddlefront.com. And they had the, um, there's like five versions. There's one about the fighting in Italy. Yeah. There's one about Overlord. Yeah. And I think throughout um, Western Europe, uh, they did one about the Eastern Front. They did a modern one. Okay. Where you could play like uh, the invasion of Crimea, the Ukraine. Is and it whatnot. the real time? You could do it real time, or you could do it um, where. Like, you play like a minute or two, and it uh, stops. No, and I didn't like those. And I think the reason I didn't like those is because of their graphical presentation, right? It just, it felt, it all felt like, I I would rather be seeing that in the in the close combat presentation than poorly rendered 3D sprites, right? The The little babies running around the little world are much more immersive to me than the world that they were able to create with those games. Well, they did upgrade those games. Oh, did they? And they made them okay. a little bit better. This is a few years ago. Okay. Um, I mean, they're decent games. Yeah. Do you know what I've been looking for is a strategic level U.S. Civil War game? Oh, man, that'd be great. But I there really isn't one. No, there used to be one. That AEOGD -E game. Yeah, but those games are so weird. So what? you swore by the, the Great War version I, of that game. No, but here's the thing. I swore by it in, until the Operational Art of War came out. I'll tell you what. Because Operational Art of War is way better. Go buy that game right now. It's like $70, but go buy it. Go buy it. Is it 70 bucks? I mean, it's got like a quadrillion <coughs> things in it, though. I don't think it's that much. It may not be that much. But, oh, no, you know what was that much? The, the West Front and the East Front games. 
for that much. Oh, Gary Grisby's. Yeah, but they're so good. War in the East and War in the West. Yeah, I just don't have time for that. So you just hit save, brother. I know. You just I know. Hit save. You know, it's just like you with Star Wars and Amon. I really want to yeah. love those games. I yeah, I love them. But you know what I love more than that? Hearts of Iron Four. You know, so I love the Hearts of Iron games. I that's I another game Paradox I never games. got into. You should you should play it with me. Yeah. And you know what's an interesting game that I've always liked mm. that's in the game? It's that Men of War series. Men of War. It's a Russian company, one C publishing. Oh yeah, but those I don't I do not like those games. You know they upgraded it now, so you have all the the cool German weapons from nineteen forty five. Sure, I, there's just they, those games always felt kind of weird to me, in terms of just execu- like they just they felt unnatural to play. Like I own them all. Yeah, like I own every World War Two game ever made. How about that? Let's start there. Yeah, every World I, War Two video game ever I'm made. I'm buying that. I probably own it. I can believe that. Yeah, like I probably it's pr- probably somewhere. Um, and I, I definitely own the Men of War 1C Men of War games, right? Yeah. You, they just felt to me like they were trying to make a more immersive company of heroes. Well, it's a it's a lower level. It's like dealing with platoons and That's stuff. what Company of Heroes is. I thought it was more of a company battalion. A company? No. You know what's funny? It's huh. another game I was really wanted to get into. If I had to pick two games so yeah. or three games I can go back yeah. and get into, it would be the Gary Grisby games. It yeah. would be oh, so good. Company Heroes. Yeah. And it would be the Hearts of Iron. Oh, man. No, if I w- if you were to choose one of those, yeah, just because it's so outside the world of the other ones and yeah. it's so much its own thing. You're going to say Hearts of Iron? I'm going to say Hearts of Iron because it's the Hearts of Iron experience is not an experience you can have on a tabletop. Okay. The Gary Grigsby games, obviously, you could have on a tabletop, right? They are literally automated tabletop board games. The same can be said for, like, your 1C games or, like, your Company of Heroes games because they are essentially miniature war games, right? Mm -hmm. But you get a grand strategic, multiple AIs all interacting with each other sort of game is not something that's as easy to replicate so what came out recently mm. in Matrix Games, I don't know if and they... are just doing the big Navy update for it. It's really done. <laughs> yeah, I saw that because yeah. I own it. Oh, you I, own Hearts I own it and I should play it so more. So you're just a game trader. Yeah. Okay. Um, is Do you remember also from that company Battlefront, they have that uh, strategic art of war or strategic command yeah. where you play like all of World War One and all of World War Two, but you yes. can play smaller battles? Yes. They just... <coughs> Excuse me, folks. Uh, they just re-released the gold version of that for World War Two, and you can play the entire war. Okay. Which it, it's, I do like that. Like, I really want to play something strategic every once in a while. Yeah, and to me, if I want the strategic, I want it to be, well, I want it to be operation. No, what's above strategic the- theater? Mm, above operational, strategic. So, but well, yeah, it goes tactical, operational. Strategic. Grand strategic. I like, when I want gr- strategic, I want grand strategic, I think is what I You mean. want the whole world. Yeah, and that's why I love Hearts of Iron, right? Is because I can choose to play England and pilot England from 1930, uh, depending on your mod, for, essentially from 1936. I'll tell 19. you what I'm going to do. What? I'm going to give the game a shot. You should give the game a shot. As soon as we get off this podcast, I will download it. It takes no time to download I will. I will try to make it happen. There's like a ton of mods for it. Don't worry about the mods. Just play it vanilla to learn it. I will play it vanilla to learn it. Which yeah. country should I take? Uh, to start. Yeah, Germany. Take Germany to start because it's the easy. Like, you don't have to worry. The reason I would say take Germany is because America doesn't get pulled until later. Italy's too weak. You don't have to worry about overseas bull crap like you do with France and England. You're a nice little compact source of evil in the heart of Europe and you can just play from there. Uh, I am going to try it out okay. and then I'll tell you what I will tell folks how I'm doing on it. You should. And you know maybe I should post like who I am on on uh, yeah on because you can play it against other people right? You can and we should do some multiplayer. We should do some multiplayer action. I think I like that. Yeah. And so we could be like and the thing is you can make it ridiculous right? You could be like Hungary and <clears throat> fucking Greece. And take over the world. Well, those were war-winning countries. I know. Well, you could make them so. 
Yeah. If you so chose. Could you imagine that? Like you dominate the world is Greece. My favorite thing is to be the Belgian Lion. Because there are in one of the like the big reworking mods, they have a path for like the Belgian Lion resurgent. Right? And it's it's pretty great. And you could do that whole Africa thing. You can do that whole Africa thing and you could also be fascist if you and you could be you could have a fascist Belgium. You know what's funny? Right. Just like Sweden and Switzerland, Belgium also declared absolute neutrality. Didn't work out too well for it them. It did not work out well for them. Negative, which is why if you're playing Belgium, you always ally yourself. With yourself. Huh. You you always you always become a belligerent. Really? Yeah. And you attack what? Holland? Uh, no, you don't attack country. anyone because the game is based off of an increasing amount of global tension, right? Right. And so you become not unaligned. Hmm. And so it, sooner or later you can start to form your own alliances once the global tension gets high enough. And you can form the Galactic Empire. You can form the Galactic Belgian Empire. Indeed, right? Because sooner, in, in like half the games, France is going to go communist. Just because. Just because they're France. Just because they're France. Yeah. And so it's going to be an England stands alone with a communist France and a fucking, you know, fascist Germany and a communist. So in this podcast, yeah. we're going to get an E rating and we're going to get a, an official rebuke by the Republic of France. I hope so. Oh, that'd so be... all you have to do is you haven't sent me podcasts to edit in ages. Because I've been doing it myself. I'm glad. But if you send it to me, I could put funny noises in where I cuss. No, I think people miss your uh, and your, the, your I, blue humor. I hope so, because I have the best humor. So we covered miniatures. Yes. We covered board war games. We covered yes. video games. Yes. I, what's the next? Books and TV? Books and TV. Well, <gasps> it's 1030. Well, we've been doing this for a long time. How long have we been going? How long do you think we've been going? I think we have been going for a total of 50 minutes. No, it's actually been an hour. I was close. Yeah. Well, you know, people, people, who knows when you're going to be on next? Okay, that's true. Uh, it'll be Cold Wars at the very latest. Are or you, you definitely could, coming to Cold I'm, Wars? I'm coming to Cold Wars. Or you could just invite me onto a podcast. You're always busy. I'm ne- I have, I literally you're always You're always dungeoning and dragoning I, and stuff you, like you that. You just have to give me a little bit of heads up, and then we could schedule it. Because I said, hey, in December, we should get together and podcast. And I, I said yes, and then you never, I never heard from you again. Yeah, well, you know, it's, I, I'm and not a beggar. But... I said yes, and then I never heard from you again. That's not, not begging. Uh, you know what it was? forgetting to ask me. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a resounding yes. Okay, yes. Okay. Yes. And, you know, I'll tell you what. Well, we'll put this on. When this is out, we'll put a Facebook thing on. Should 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 Sean be back? Or if you want, I don't even have to be back. Yeah, because fuck that. Ma- I'll see. There I go again. It's okay. You've already bought us uh, the I've E. I've already done it. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm here to bring you the E rating because without an E rating, are you really a podcast? No, you're not. Yeah. I, I don't know how all those other guys do it. Yeah. I don't, I don't, well, that's weird. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's good stuff, but... Uh, Dude, I mean, it's good seeing you again. It's, I love you, it's, Bill. I love you, too. It's it's good having you back in the fray. It's good to be here. If I could move all you to Ohio and out of this cesspool of awful, angry people, I would. You know, I got to be honest. I, I've lived in a lot of places in my life. Yes. And Ohio we, is just, it doesn't hold anything for me. Cleveland is one of the greatest cities in America. It's done. Says who? Says me. Says the fact that we have one of the best orchestras. We have the best orchestra in the oh, country. Oh, because that's how I picked my cities to live in. Was I done? Did I finish? Can I finish? Can I finish? No, no, no. Go ahead. That was a little Ross Perot, ladies and gentlemen. I took us all the way back. Yeah. To 1994. 80. No, 88. Or maybe that was 1988. No, when it was 92. No, 92 and 96, yeah. All the way back to 1992 and 1996 with Ross Perot. Can I finish? Okay. And you know what's most funny? Most what? people remember Dana Carvey doing him as oh, opposed yeah, that's, to him doing it. Yeah, I was literally just doing Dana Carvey doing Ross Perot. I wasn't actually doing Ross Perot. So anyway, yeah, Cleveland. Okay, Cleveland. We have one of the best art museums in the country. We have some of the best education in the country. We have two of the best hospital systems in the country. We have the best orchestra in the country and arguably one of the top five orchestras in the world. Uh, we have an amazing lakefront uh, where you can you know, go sailing. We have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We have three major sports teams. Are you getting paid by their Chamber of Commerce? I'm not. I just love my hometown that much that I can tell you everything good about it. Elliot Ness lived there and is in fact buried at one of the most gorgeous cemeteries in the country, which is actually just a five-minute walk from my apartment. Yeah. We, we have the second highest per capita Jewish population in the country and have, therefore, some amazing, amazing Jewish delis. What's the, uh, what's the, 
Are there are a lot of hot women there. There are a, a lot of hot women there. Mm. You know, I, I used to watch a Drew Carey show. It didn't Don't, convince me. Yeah, well, nothing about Drew Carey could, should convince you of anything. Because he's, he's, he's a festering not great person. Really? Yeah. Uh, okay, I have actually... He went to Kent State University. Yes. Along with Michael Keaton, by the way. So if you like Batman, yeah. you should... And also, uh, the dude who invented... Uh, the dude who invented Superman? Cleveland. Who invented Superman? I can't remember his Stan name. Stanley? Right. No, not Stanley. Stanley's from like New York. But uh, I can't remember his name right now because I don't like DC all that much. But for people who love Superman, Superman's from Cleveland. Mother yeah. Well, I'm just uh, dropping the mic right there. Ugh. Well, I, you know, I'll be in Ohio for two weeks. You will, but in, you'll not uh, be in the good part of Ohio. You'll be in Dayton. I'll be in Dayton. So, I mean, maybe I'll take a trip up to Cleveland. You should. So, I mean, it's... Actually, you absolutely should. I should? Yes. Can you set the lake on fire for me? I can't anymore. I want to see. Thank you, EPA. I want to see the uh, the uh, the f- flames on the river. I'm just saying. So I can sing "Smoke on the Water." Th- that's that's not where that comes from. Well, it's it, I could sing it anyway. I'm well, I'll tell you what. We'll have to do a tour. Bob Hope's from Cleveland. Huh? Bob Hope. No, he's not. Is he? Yeah, buddy. Okay. What else? I I mean. Uh, I'm good right now. I'm pretty tired. I Who's the mayor of Cleveland? The uh, the current mayor of Cle I don't remember his name. Michael Ian Black. No, it's not Michael Ian Black. He's a comedian. Um, he would be a good mayor. He though. would be a great mayor. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. Well, I'll have to check it out and see see what's going on. But you know, we talked about a lot. We did, and we never talked about First Man. So we, we just finished watching First can Man. We just, can we just say a couple of things about First Man? Yeah, I liked it. I loved all of the space stuff. Yeah, but they did not make me care about anyone in it but you cared about the journey i so i almost cared about neil armstrong's journey who's from who is from yellow springs ohio yeah yeah another great ohioan ladies and gentlemen and yeah. don't, don't give me this crap about oh because they're from ohio whoa that was weird i didn't expect to see a lady wearing depends on tv <laughs> I know it's kind of hot. It's not. There was nothing hot about that. We 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 have the TV on here. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I felt like they were trying to pull back so far from high personality space movies. Yes. Like, uh, I just blanked on it. Even though I, I just gave Apollo you Apollo thirteen, uh, like Apollo thirteen, or like uh, even the Mars one, um, which oh. wasn't. You know, it's not the Martian. His, the Martian, even though it's not historical, that's heavily based in science or like the right stuff. Where like you, it's all about the dudes and how they're space cowboys, and we're going out there, and we're gonna go land on the moon, and we're gonna we're gonna have some great music playing up in space, and it's gonna be awesome, right? Like they have they they pulled back so far from that as to make I didn't know anyone's name, and that's a regal problem after two and a half hours. Yeah, really? Yes. Because uh, it means I didn't. Con- I don't. I didn't. I think it's 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 a. I, I'm it, like that's about, the guy from Rome, and there's porn stash, right? I, I think it's 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 man's battle with technology to evolve. And you know what? Again, I'll say that would be great if it was a documentary, which it tried to pretend it half was. You know, but and you I, can't I'm swearing to, and, and well. he will deny this now. But we saw Solo just before he left, and I remember Solo walking out, and he said he hated it. I never, I would never, I did not say that. You said that movie was horrible. I did not say that. Yeah, no I, part of me. I even think like you threw up after that movie. I think you're just you're just trying to troll me now, and it's not going to work because I'm a stronger man than you. I remember you 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 puking off that uh, bridge. Yeah, I was, am troll proof. You're like I cannot believe that they you cannot they screwed me. up that movie. How can you screw up a movie that didn't have any backstory beforehand? Isn't Obi Wan coming out? Next? I hope so. Oh my god, I hope so. And it better have you. No, no. The next one's going to be the Mandalorian. And who's that going to feature? Uh, Boba Fett, because it's the Mandalorian. Oh, that's right. I like Boba Fett just because I like seeing Boba Fett. You don't. You don't even know who Boba Fett is. No one knows who Boba Fett is. Yeah, I do. No, you don't. No one knows who. Like you, you see a dude in Mandalorian armor, and you go, "I like the armor." No, and it, I like nerdish integrations. But, but you know, that. but he was like a clone or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyway, I yeah, I think it's time. It's <laughs> when Shot starts throwing up onto the microphone. Yeah, we have mentioned the the first three Star Wars movies, the second three first three Star Wars movies. That's when Sean throws up. 
Well, I heard that you were a big Jar Jar Bings fan. Uh, you know, there was an actually a really interesting documentary with that guy, and how like he nearly killed himself and has like found peace and he's yeah. hated. Yeah, but the thing is, I I agree with what a, a dear friend of mine said. The hatred for Jar Jar Binks and the actor Jar Jar Binks is just mist ha- misplaced hatred for a certain developer of Star Wars. Really? Yes. Well, but unfortunately, he played Jar Jar Binks, and he, he has to suffer. Yeah, and when he- you take an acting role, and here's something I'll tell you as a future voice actor. Let's say you really, act. Are going to give me some acting advice right now? No, I'm going to give you some acting advice because Thank I think you. it's good advice. From your decades of history. Whatever. I still, can, I still can have an opinion. I'm a gamer. Yeah, it's true. So let's say you do a voiceover where you're doing like Slobodan Milosevic's voice. Yeah, I'm not going to do that kind of voice acting. With let's one. say the hatred for Slobodan goes to you. You have to own it. Does you any, does you anybody, played Slobodan Milosevic. You know who's going to know who Slobodan Milosevic is? Just a bunch of gamer nerds and no one else. I would say. You know why? Because it's not 1996. So what happens? Okay, so let's say you play Magda G- Goebbels in that thing. If I, I, I'm going to play Magda Goebbels. That's going to happen. You what? Hey, what? Are you, you not do? that good of a voice actor where you, you don't have that stretch? Yeah, let's go talk now, shall we? Would you like to go talk to Hitler? No, we have to poison our children. No, no sorry. We, we must go poison our children right now, yeah? So, I mean, it's, the if you're going to take the role. And then I'm going to eat a bullet. If you're gonna take, be very, very if you're gonna take the role, I think you have to accept because the communists are coming. I think you have to accept the hatred that comes along with it. That's a Brandenburg Gate. I do not think that's true. I think that is totally true. I don't. I absolutely don't think that's true. And here's why. Yeah. If that was true, every character who ever played a villain would be lynched. It's hard lynched to change somebody's the wrong mind. Word. And I'll, I'll give you a thing. Who's that pretty boy that was just in um, the the movie of Lady Gaga? What's his name? Yeah, no, I know who you're talking about. You're right. Matthew McCutt, no. No, um, it was the other the other guy, right? Yeah. What movie did you, you see him in first? Uh, what movie? Did, uh, what Hot American Summer. Okay. but They keep getting younger and I Ma- keep staying the same age. Oh, no, that was Matthew That's Matthew McConaughey. McConaughey. Never mind. But he played that, that dick boyfriend in Wedding Crashers. I don't remember that movie. And you just didn't like him. But he came back from that. Yeah. But I, I didn't like him. And I'm sure he's a great guy. I like that guy as an actor. And, you know, neither of us can say what his name is, so this is really devolving into nothing burger right. at this point. And it's just you, you. I mean, when that guy that was in American Pie goes anywhere, people still say Stifler. Yes. And that was like 20 years ago. Yeah, and he will always be Stifler. And I think if you're going to take a role, you have to own the role. I think people get I know it. that Daniel Day-Lewis to this day likes being called Mr. Lincoln. That's possible, but Daniel Day-Lewis is a very, very special individual who will never act in Hollywood again by his own admission. Really? He's done. Yeah, he has done his eight Hollywood movies that he will ever do. Okay. But I'm just saying- And we'll have won an Academy Award for each and every one of them because he's that good of an actor. I'm just saying, like, you know, these guys, and you'll always remember him. Like, you ever see the movie The Reader? If you want to see Kate Blanchett nude, you have to watch that movie. Okay, well, now I have to go watch that movie. Yeah. But the guy that plays the law professor was the guy that played Hitler in Downfall. And I'm still waiting for him to have a rant in that movie. I just can't get over it. I can't move on. And we are going to go take our armies over there. And where are they? There are no armies. Yeah, Fegelein. Fegelein! There's Fegelein! So anyway, once again, welcome back. Thank you. You were missed. And uh, I'm going to turn it back to you. Oh. To outro us. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to today's podcast. I don't know. Did we give this podcast a name, or does it have an episode number? Uh, this sh- I If I get it out next week, it'll be episode 33, season two. Welcome to season two, episode 33. Thank you so much for listening to me and my dear compadre, Mitch the Meta Reed, as we both walked down memory lane, walked over some board games, and enjoyed a little chat with you, our friends, on No Dice, No Glory. And if you want to see more shows like this, please tell us, and uh, all right. Pay me money. We're going to wrap it up and send it back to the studio. Bye, Felicia. Bye. Thanks so much for joining the show tonight. Remember to follow us on Twitter at No Dice, No Glory. And keep the conversation going on NoDiceNoGlory.com, now featuring our own message boards. Have a great night, everybody.